The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Merry meet and merry part, bright the cheeks and warm the heart. For tread the circle thrice about to keep unwelcome spirits out. Bide within the law you must, in perfect love and perfect trust. Mind the threefold laws you should, three times bad and three times good. These eight words the read fulfill, and ye harm none to what ye will. Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Merry Meet, everybody, and welcome. Now, tonight we're going to be talking to Bruce Schofield, the author of The Nature of Astrology. And in addition, just to me behind the wheel tonight, I've invited Barbara Duncan to be my guest co-host this week. Because some books are just too good that it takes two to do justice. And so, um, Bruce... And you me... didn't have to twist my arm, Marla. No, you didn't. I know. That, that was the good part. Because I know what you like. Um, <laughs> yeah, the interest in book is in your book. And, and again, this is... You always get me up because of the book... Um, your book uh, bank... Or whatever, you know, all that money that you keep aside for books. My book budget, yes. Your book budget, yes. And I know I keep blowing it, but but you're really happy about this book, so this is good. <laughs> but let's tell everybody a little bit about Bruce. Um, he holds a doctorate in geosciences from the University of Massachusetts, a master's degree in social sciences from Montclair University, and a degree in history from Rutgers University. He's currently an instructor for Kepler College and president of the Professional Astrologers Alliance, as well as being the prolific author of 14 books. Now, questions and comments are welcome from the chat room. And those who aren't here with us and listening live, come join us at paraxradionetwork.com. All right, Barbara, thank you for joining me tonight as as as. Like I said, you didn't have to twist your arm, but I'm really happy that you're here because it's a topic that is near and dear to your heart. Very much so. And Bruce, thank you for being with us as well. Oh, you're welcome. All right, so we got a lot to cover. The hour is going to go short, so I'm just jumping right in. Um, <laughs> so the book is an in-depth examination of how astrology is a form of system science rather than subjective fortune telling. And the practice goes back in time to our ancient ancestors. Um, what was the earliest kind of recording history of astrology? Well, in uh, in the Western world, it was actually the, the ancient Near East. You had a long tradition of uh, sky watchers who um, kept records and noticed correlations between the positions of the planets and the movements of the sun and moon and things like weather and uh, what was going on in their communities and the you know the experiences that the rulers or the uh, kings were uh, going through and these accumulated over you know a couple thousand years and eventually were put into a uh, a form that's very similar to what we have today uh, around uh, Couple hundred, a couple of centuries be, uh, BCE, and uh, a few centuries afterwards. So, roughly about two thousand years ago, astrology took a form that we can recognize. The Greeks contributed a lot to it. Well, you know, what was astrology in? You're talking about sky watchers. What were they looking for? I mean, were they talking or thinking about it as something for divination or some some nature? Stuff. Well, it's, you know, we, we can't go back there and know what they were thinking, but well, I, yeah. I suspect they were, uh, you know, basically naturalists. You know, when you're living mm-hmm. uh, hundreds of thousand years of human evolution, people needed to know their environment. Yeah. And uh, when you got 
uh, agricultural civilization and you were staying in one place over and over again. Uh, one thing that was very important was being able to predict the seasons. And I think trying knowing when rain would come, for example, or um, any other kind of event that would affect agriculture. This, this was, you know, primo knowledge. You had to have it. Mm-hmm. And since the seasons are clearly controlled by the sun, you know, the assumption was there there may be more information, more messages, signals from the objects in the sky that correlate to the needs of the people. I, I bet not I, that so many of them that were looking up there were just looking because, oh, with stars and planets and stuff there. I mean, there were scholars in to, uh, lack of a better term um, that were really putting it together and making some sense out of it, weren't they? Well, they were noticing correlations and then they were developing the means by which they could predict when those planetary patterns would recur and and then they can have a prediction. You know, so mm-hmm. if they noticed that there were droughts every uh, 20 years, that was significant because you know, then you could stockpile water. And it's interesting that they were taking notes, at, you know, even if they were mental notes, you know, they were they were keeping abreast of that. They were writing them down on cuneiform tablets, which are okay. clay tablets, and they inscribe them uh, with um, a stylus. And these things are clay. And when when they're burned, when a building was burned down that had a lot of tablets in them, they just made them harder. Mm. And uh, there's thousands of them that still haven't been translated. The British Museum has a lot of them. But there's there's a basically a, a, a collection of them that have to do with uh, astrology, a- astrological omens, they call them, the omen books. Uh, but a lot of them are on the sun, moon, every planet has uh, a section. Uh, Venus in particular was studied in detail. And those are among the oldest records that we have. They go back almost 2000 years. Wow. Well, that in the um, advent of geometry, uh, um, played a good role, right? Well, a little bit later, uh, okay. geometry is mostly associated with the Greeks, um, but the but the Mesopotamian people, um, the Sumerians and the Babylonians. Babylonia was kind of like the uh, the center, you know, the intellectual center of that whole area there, and that's where a lot of the science, uh, you know, was developed. And um, they left they left some things that we still use, like you know, sixty you know, seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. And the circle is 360, you know, they kind of fit well. The Greeks then took it further. It was, you know, I mean, there are so many different types of astrology practiced worldwide. I mean, Chinese astrology, Vedic astrology, you've written books on Mayan and Native American astrology, and I'm sure there's many, many more. So is the word astrology kind of an umbrella term for Well, yeah. you know, in in um in India, the practice of looking at the positions of the planets and making uh analyzing birth charts and making predictions is called uh, Jyotish. In in the West it was originally known as Hindu astrology. Um or Indian astrology, and then it's been called Vedic astrology. Mm -hmm. Uh, People associate it with the Vedas, although there really wasn't much astrology in the Vedas, just some like lunar patterns. But in any case, it's um, that's a tradition. Uh, The Chinese have a tradition as well. And uh, in Mesoamerica, um, Olmec and Maya and Toltec and Aztec peoples had a system as well. Now, whether you should call them astrology I think that's probably a good general name. You could argue about Mesoamerica because it's a little different, but Mm -hmm. a lot of their, um, the work that they did was based on planetary cycles. They were, they were observing Venus intensely and they were trying to find commonalities like the lowest common denominator where all the planetary cycles could fit in. So there is an, Astro, you know, astro means star. There is a, you know, an astrological component to what was developed there. Okay. And then astrology and astronomy at one point were as one, weren't they? Yeah, the same, the same people that did astrology did astronomy and they were also mathematicians. And the, the separation occurred 
gradually but accelerated uh, during the Renaissance when uh, astronomy became more focused. But it was clearly a distinction. Uh, Ptolemy in 150 AD describes the difference between the two in his book, um, Tetrabiblos. But the, the need to do mathematics was such a part of it that anybody doing either of those subjects, and like I said, they often did this, all of them, would be a mathematician. And in uh, the Renaissance in Italy, uh, the um, astrologers were called matematici, mathematicians. Mm. That's interesting. I've got one more question. I know Barbara's got a whole bunch too, but I just want to get one more out. Um, okay. <laughs> And, you know, many people consider astrology a form of divination, dealing with the rhythms of the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars. We all know this. But you argue that astrology is not only a practice, but also a science, specifically a form of system science. So what is system science? Well, first of all, let me just say that I'm arguing that astrology is a subject. Okay. Now, the subject, it's a subject with a practice like medicine or psychology. Mm -hmm. So there's a practice and the practice is not a science. It's it's a it's an art, but it's based on scientific, you know, information. Mm -hmm. So a doctor gets a, you know, a, an X-ray, you know, that's made from a machine that was developed, you know, by engineers who knew the science behind it. You know, and astrologers look at a birth chart that's based on exact positions of uh, the planets. Right. So. But the interpretation of it is not a science. Mm -hmm. Then, it, but if you say that astrology is a, is a subject, a subject also includes a history. Okay, so astrology's got a history, and it's been developed quite a bit in the last couple few decades. Um, it has theory. You know, subject has theory. Uh, there's medical theory. You know, there's there's theor there are theories in psychology, um, and. Astrology is a little weak on that area because you don't get paid to do any of this. Uh, there's also research. There's a lot of money going to medical research and, you know, quite a lot of money going to psychological research, but pretty much zero going to uh, astrological research. So astrology, if you call it a subject, which I think it is, is kind of weak in theory and research. And if it were stronger in those categories, you could say that it was a science, or at least that part of it is a science. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Barbara? <laughs> Where do I start? First I know, I know. <laughs> That's why I had to I get all I love my this first. book. Yeah. Oh, good. I just adore it. And the reason I started chapter the, the first chapter, first paragraph going, where is he going with this to Wow. <laughs> Um, because, you know, you're talking about forming um, a subject matter, but it seems to me it sort of is, when you describe it in your book, as an integrative um, science. Yeah, well, that's that's right. I mean, if you, you take, um, you know, and it's not the only one, you know, if, if you're a, a biologist and you're, you know, looking at an ecosystem, you can't just take one thing out of that ecosystem and bring it into the laboratory and, you know, study it like crazy and know what the ecosystem is doing, because the ecosystem is a system. It's it's a, a collection of things that are self-organizing. And self-organizing systems are um, it's a class, it's a, a, a an aspect of nature. It's, it's a, a class of things in nature, cells and bodies and uh, mental systems like the stock market, uh, the solar system. The, this is a class of subject material in nature that does not lend itself to reductionism, which is what most people call science. People say, follow the science. What they're talking about is reduction, reductive science, reductionism. But most people don't understand that. Science is bigger than reductionism. You're going to get some pushback from some physicists and you know, people that follow the positivist philosophy on that, but you'll say, oh, there's nothing better. You know, everything should be physics. We're going to, you know, we know a lot and everything else is going to be figured out eventually. But physics doesn't do that well when it comes to systems. It needs a different kind of approach. And that that's known by a lot of people. 
uh, part of the problem is that system science, which has been around for at least 100 years, uh, is spread out among the disciplines. So you have people that are, you know, uh, system oriented in biology and in geosciences and in medicine and so on, ecology, um, even engineering. But they're they're not in one 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 focused area. They don't speak in a unified voice and they have different names. You, you've probably heard of chaos and complexity mm -hmm. and fractals. This is all part of system science. But people don't know the differences. So what I'm saying in my book, which I don't know that anyone's really said it before, at least in quite the same way as, as I do, because I just repeat it over and over again, um, drumming it into the reader <laughs> uh, that that astrology only works with systems self-organizing systems, that's its subject matter. And, and there are other subjects that study systems, but what astrology does is it maps them out in such a way that you can interpret them and also predict their trajectories. So that's how natal horoscope reading and birth chart reading and uh, you know forecasting come into the picture. Astrology provides that, which other subjects don't. But the subject matter itself that astrology is studying are these self-organizing systems. Okay. It's nice to put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Cybernetics uh, is another name for, yeah, it, for the yeah, study yeah. Of, of, of systems. And, 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 and uh, that study's changed, right? I mean, with the advent of technology, would you say that um, we're getting better at um, getting those systems in place? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, some of the early work on systems was pretty good. It was about 100 or so years ago. And then around the mid 20th century, there were a few conferences where it became more focused. Cybernetics was a big thing at that point. And a lot of it was applied to technology, but a lot of it was applied to nature as well, biology, and also anthropology. Uh, anthropologists know a lot about system science because they study human groups as systems. But it's taken a back seat to quantum mechanics, which is a little flashier, and it's all focused in really just one or two disciplines, primarily physics. And you have, like, as I said before, you have these system people all over the map. But it's still there. It um, doesn't get the podium very often. I think it, it will have to get the podium more often because we have two huge issues that humanity has to face. And one of them is climate change. You cannot understand climate change unless you understand that the climate is a system. It's not a matter of just pulling one switch. And you know that that is going to force people into looking at the interconnectedness of our our biosphere, which is a system. It's like the it's, that's the biggest ecosystem. And the other thing is that within humans ourselves, we have a system. We have a uh, a microbiome. We have an internal ecology. We have, we have a lot of cells of organisms that are not us within us, but we we right. depend on them, and they actually have some you know some effect on our moods. So if you know anything about the microbiome and its the vagus nerve and its connection to the brain, it's quite spectacular. So a lot of medical problems will need to be will probably only be solved once a system perspective is taken in in medicine today medicine is very reductionist you go to a specialist and the specialist only knows what they know holistic medicine is system oriented medicine but it doesn't get much attention you know, or or it gets it certainly doesn't get uh, funded by the insurance companies very often <laughs> that's for sure but that's a good thing i mean that that we have it and people are opening up more yeah <clears throat> sorry to holistic stuff well that's so that's in response to your question yes yeah, something's happening but not fast enough in my opinion <laughs> It, it's amazing. And, and you know, I'm sitting here and I'm listening and I'm thinking there's a lot of people that will be listening and being really kind of surprised that astrology is more than horoscopes or sun oh, yeah. signs, you know. Um, and I think I think you're doing a great service to a lot of people by writing this book. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, astrology is not just the zodiac. Um, and just uh, uh, some details here. 
The word horoscope, it's a Greek word, it reply, uh, refers to the view of the hour. So it's probably best associated with just the ascendant or the rising sign. Mm. I like to use the word birth chart for the, you know, the entire uh, collection. And basically the birth chart is, you know, it's the primary tool of most astrologers. It's not the only tool available, but it's the primary one. It's basically a graph. It's a graph. It's, it's a map of the sky at a specific time and place. When you see people, they when they you see their charts. I mean, mm -hmm. they are so complicated. Um, you know, um, with yeah, the house it gets wild. And that. Yeah, I know. I, 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 Barbara and I have talked about that. I'm going, oh my god, how can you read that? You know, I mean, I mean she knows way more than I do. Um, but it it is very kind of mathematically, um, and that is another reason I just block it out for a minute. But um, it, it's just amazing. If somebody sees a really well done chart, it, it's fantastic. They really are. Well, it's a lot. To, there's a lot to know. Um, it, and it helps to uh, start learning astrology when you're young. I was fortunate enough to come across it when I was about 18 or 19. And one of the reasons was I had a, a few girlfriends and they were all born on the same day. And my Male friends were born within a day or two of, of that. It's October 10th is the magic day. <laughs> wow. But uh, but I thought that was peculiar. And one of them did have a few astrology books and knew a little bit about it. And I took a look at him and I was quite surprised. I had thought astrology was uh, a pseudoscience. That's what I was told. Uh, but when I read the books and started testing it myself, it seemed to work. I got hooked and I spent a lot of time learning it when I was young. It's like learning a language. Mm -hmm. You do much better when you're younger. Yeah. Barbara? And there's a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still learning. I, I told oh, somebody yeah. the other day that, you know, uh, I'm 74. I've, so I've been around the block a few times with with Saturn, Saturn return. But I, I really think I need a, about another two lifetimes to really get astrology down the way I would like to. Well, that, that's it about your book. And I was reading the first few chapters, which... Um, are basically back science stories, but very relevant. And, you know, I looked at it and I didn't quite look at it the same way you did or even thought about it. And I don't think most astrologers do, which is humans are the sum of a lot of permutations going on in our galaxy, a lot of revolutions around the galaxy, the sun mm -hmm. um, and the planets. And, you know, our DNA the DNA of a banana, the DNA of a goat are, you know, there is a lot of correlation there. You know, we're all intertwined in that same um, dance of uh, the planets, as you say. it. Yeah, well, life has only been here for about three and a half billion years. The Earth is mm -hmm. about four and a half billion years old. So about a billion years into it, we got life. We're not sure how that happened, um, but it, it's, you know, it could be a chemical thing. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that comets have brought in organic materials and they may have accumulated and something may have formed. There are people that um, are advocates of what's called panspermia, where the Earth was seeded by life from somewhere else. And, you know, some it's known that uh, DNA can survive in space. I mean, they've spaceships have come back. And, you know, some of the bacteria on them are fine. Right. Tardigrades. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, but of course, if, if it's the panspermia hypothesis is right, then, you know, it kind of just pushes the problem back a little bit further. In any case, we, we've got three and a half billion years of evolution and we only got animals about 500 million years ago. And we only got people about two million years ago, uh, you know, right. about six million years ago or seven million years ago. It's roughly around that time. Uh, there was a split in the chimpanzee line and we became one of the groups <laughs> and the chimps and the bonobos were went, you know, in another direction. There was a switch. So we're not we haven't been around that long. And, well, you know, and so but we've inherited so much from the, you know, our, our uh, common ancestry. And what I try to get at in that first chapter in particular is that, you know, right almost right from the beginning, life was internalizing the rhythms of the you know, the, of alternation of day and night and the rhythms of the sky, the moon, all these, you know, life developed in the seas first. And the moon is a very big deal for a marine organism. 
and you've got tides. And, and I give examples of how these organisms today will uh, spawn at certain phases of the moon. And they have these, you know, single cells have tracking abilities to track these these objects. So, I mean, if a single cell can do that, imagine what a, a you know, a megafauna like humans could do. It's unlimitless anything, <laughs> you know, yeah. anything is possible. And we just don't know. I mean, we know foundation, we know basics, but yeah. some people don't go looking farther than that. But there's like peeling an onion, lots and lots of layers there. Yeah, it's evolution. Yeah. Well, I like your, your study in the beginning mm -hmm. when you were working with Saturn. Yeah, that's right. And uh, And its effect upon weather and how Jupiter factored in a little bit, but really didn't. Yeah, that see, that's an interesting thing. And, you know, when I get some time, I'm going to, um, I started on, I'm going to write a paper on Jupiter, because when I did the Saturn study, and I did it for my PhD uh, the thesis uh, dissertation, mm -hmm. and, you know, my committee was very skeptical, but I was getting results and showing that there was uh, a significant correlation between temperatures um, you know, which you can get. They don't go back too far. The longest temperature databases are you know, a little over 200 years, and the ones in the United States are more like 100, 150. Um, so you, you, it would be nice to have a 1,000-year database because then you can prove something decisively. But anyway, I was able to find a correlation. And then once I did, I had to have some control experiments. So I generated random dates, and I did that. And then I took Jupiter, and ran that, I didn't find anything significant. But what I did find is that Jupiter scored high with precipitation. So this raises a really big problem. I mean, you know, you'd think that Jupiter would would have a similar effect to Saturn. It's a bigger planet, would have even more gravity. But there's something going on there that's very strange. And uh, it'll be a while before I think we can figure it out. Well, did you take into account, and I think it was the paper in Science in 2016, um, that Jupiter doesn't actually orbit the sun. There is a orbital point 30,000 miles off the sun's surface that they're both kind of doing this dance around. Yeah, well, that's and, called the Barry Center. Yeah, do you think that that has um, an effect to that? Yeah, that I, I have a, whole, a couple sections in the book talk about that. The, um, okay. there, are, there are people that have been in astrology uh, that have looked at that and people that are in the geosciences and astronomy as well, because the sun and the planets orbit around the center of mass of the solar system. And it's not always the sun. Sometimes the sun is in there, but a lot of times it's out of it. The sun has its own 180 year cycle around the Barry Center. And there are, are some um, astrologically oriented climatologists that have tried to correlate that with uh, climate patterns. And uh, yeah, there's, there's, that's a, a very important point. And it's also uh, common with other star systems. It's one of the ways that you can discover an exoplanet. You can see that the star is, you know, moving its, or it's, it's, uh, you know, shifting its, its position. And so you can compute what's pulling it in what direction. But yeah, this, the, the, it's the center of mass of the solar system that everything orbits around, and that's called the Barry Center. Hmm. You know, I, I tried very hard to um, look at heliocentric astrology, and I never could quite grasp the, the whole process um, when it comes to using Jupiter or Saturn as a means for prediction of, say, earthquake. Well... Predicting earthquakes is, you know, nobody to my knowledge has done that with any high degree of accuracy in astrology. But in the book, I point out that there are there's some evidence, some experiments uh, point in the direction that there may be something to it. Uh, in regard to heliocentric astrology, you should talk to Michael Erlewine. Uh, oh, look yeah. at Look at his his books because he was the one that went into that. Uh, there's. Not many people use heliocentric uh, no. positions, but uh, John Nelson, who I mentioned in a few places, did, and he was able to predict radio storms for RCA, and mm. uh, they they kept him employed for a long time. He claimed to be very accurate, although he's attacked regularly by the um, self-appointed pit bulls of science that call themselves skeptics. 
All right. Well, we're going to have to take a break. That first half hour just went flying by. (laughs) So everybody say stay put and we'll be back in about two minutes. Steering the Cauldron will be right back. So don't go away. If you end up with webbed feet, remember, you've been warned. Come explore an innovative oracle deck that looks into the world of the wise women, the healers, the seers, the witch. This powerful and insightful deck was created by Marla Brooks, host of Stirring the Cauldron on the Para-X radio network and beautifully illustrated by Anya Khan. It includes an easy-to-read booklet and guide with straightforward, gentle guidance on using the deck and interpreting the messages of the cards. And unlike other Oracle decks, each card comes with its own personalized magical incantation that provides energy, reinforces the card's meaning, and helps the desired message to be sent out into the universe. The Witch's Oracle is the ideal divination deck for witches and non-pagans alike, and it works well for both seasoned readers and beginners. To find out more about the Witch's Oracle deck, go to www.marlabrooks.com and click on the Oracle Deck link. Hey everyone, it's Marla. If you like tonight's episode of Stirring the Cauldron and the Archive Podcast as well, take a look at the show's YouTube channel and check out the dozens of shows that are there just waiting to be heard. New shows are added each week, and while you're there, why not subscribe? It's free. And if you click on that tiny little bell icon at the top of the page, you'll be notified when new shows are available. Just go to youtube.com and then type in Stirring the Cauldron Pair X and the link will appear. Just like magic. Hi, Barry McGuire here, inviting you to come along with Marla Brooks and let's start stirring the cauldron together on Para X. Stirring the cauldron with Marla Brooks, Thursdays at 9 o'clock on Para X. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. And welcome back. Um, Tonight we're talking with Ruth Schofield. He's the author of The Nature of Astrology. And my co-host tonight is Barbara Duncan, who is probably sitting on about 50 different questions that that she still wants to talk about. But I do have one quick question. Yeah, chat room question. Um, She would like to know if you could explain what is astrometeorology? Okay, good question. Uh, Astrometeorology is the application of astrology to weather, and its origins go back to the origins of astrology itself. Uh, Earlier, I was talking about the uh, ancient Mesopotamian peoples, the Babylonians among them. looking at weather and correlating it with planetary positions. And and one of the most obvious ways uh, correlations would be the seasons. You know, the sun rises further and further to the north as, you know, the year goes on and it gets hotter and hotter and, you know, and then it moves south and it gets colder. So there's a correlation between where the sun rises, how high it is in the sky and the seasons. But it was taken a lot further and during the um, Roman period into the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, it, the typical astrologer would know something about weather prediction and be able to do it, where they would make charts for the first day of spring or they would make charts for the uh, the full moon or the new moon, or they would just watch the aspects among the planets. And we have a a little bit of a survival of this in the almanacs. It was in the uh, 15th and 16th century almanacs came about because of printing and the astrologers had a lot to do with them. They would indicate things like uh, weather ahead of time, where the planets would be, what the phases of the moon would be. And uh, back then, knowing the phases of the moon was very important because they didn't have uh, electric lighting. I'm just thinking we keep talking about the moon and, and you know, the, with the tide and all that. And and keeps popping into my head about people saying that the moon makes other people crazy. Now, where did that come from? Do you know? 
lunacy. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, there's a tradition that it, you know, is a little um, destabilizing. And there have been studies that show that that may be the case. And there's studies that show that it may not be the case. So this is something still under investigation, I suppose. But um, I notice a lot of events uh, that will correlate with the full moon. You know, you, whenever there's an ongoing process, like, for example, electing the Speaker of the House, it only came together right at the full moon. Mm-hmm. And, and you'll see this a lot of times. But, but not, you know, it's not every time there's an ongoing process. But there are higher tides and uh, there are atmospheric tides. There are a lot of things that go on that, that change as the moon goes through its phases. And I think that we'll eventually come to see that there are these deep correlations with uh, the cycle of the moon and the state of the brain, the, the mental state. Um, certainly, lunar uh, effects are more easily seen when you have a group of people together. You know, there's there's a you know, there's what's called quorum sensing where, mm-hmm. where you get enough people or enough bacteria and suddenly there's a shift into this other reality. So if you're a person that happens to study groups of, say, a thousand or more and their behavior, you might be able to detect correlations with the phases of the moon, particularly the full moon. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that anybody's actually done that. Uh, in any kind of significant way. Well, it's a good excuse for people. Well, you know, the moon did it or, you know, Mercury in retrograde. Oh, Oh, my God, let's blame it. Yeah, (laughs) blame it on that. So, yeah. Um, Barbara, I know you're sitting still on a pile of questions, so go for it. Well, well, let's go back to our, you know, poor... um, Poorly maligned Mercury retrograde for a minute. (laughs) Um, Because there is that... And I don't know, it's the part of your book, I think, that talks a lot about astrology painting itself into a corner. And that is a lot of pop uh, astrologers will say, oh, it's Mercury retrograde. Let's blame it on Mercury retrograde. Yeah. When in fact, it, there's a myriad of things that could be happening. We just had a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction series that just sort of blew things off the charts. Well, with Pluto. Yeah. Yeah. That hadn't happened for a long time. Right. That was the 2020. That was a lot of astrologers predicted some kind of calamity. I predicted mm-hmm. like a black swan event that would that would uh, raise issues of government control. A lot of astrologers, um, the more prominent ones, did predict that yeah. it was going to yeah. be quite a ride. Yeah, uh, I, I, everyone which... I knew did. You know, we were all talking about it for years ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, nobody really paid much attention to it uh, because I think, for the most part, people are living day to day. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's complicated, too, because you have a conjunction like that. And you go back to, you know, one of the last times it happened was in the early 16th century when you had the Protestant Reformation and the conquest of the Aztecs. Big events. Huge events, you know, civilization changing events. So here we are in the 20th century. Things are a little bit different. And it's it takes a lot of knowledge of history and a lot of imagination and a lot of knowledge of current events to to, act, to, to make a fairly accurate prediction. And most people are spending so much time doing the astrology. They don't have time to be an astrologer, an anthropologist. I'm sorry, a historian, an anthropologist, a sociologist you know, a political scientist, you need to have all that other information to combine it with your knowledge of astrology to make an accurate assessment of what where things seem to be going. That's that's one of one of the big problems. Astrologers know their astrology, but they're not always historians. Correct. And, and nor are they really able to ad- or have an adapted. I'm trying to figure out how to say this. I don't know if we've actually accurately adapted ourselves to a technological age. Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I mean, f- physically and, and emotionally, we're still pretty much the same as we were 50,000 years ago. Right. Mm-hmm. And even if you look at the night sky with night pollution, we are not as in touch with the night sky as we used to be. Right. I even bring that up at one point. I, you know, I talk about that, that you know, human beings – 
and other organisms, you know, may, may have these built in rhythms that were that we evolved in this rhythmic temporal environment, I call it. And they may be there, but they've been disrupted. You know, we have all these electrical fields around us and mm -hmm. we stay up late at night. And so they're they're running in us, but they're not consistent. I mean, if you're like, I'm in LA, so I look up in the sky and I can see the moon, you know, but not much else. Not yet. You, you go out to the desert and it's beautiful, you know, two hours away from us in the desert. It, it's a gorgeous sky. So, yeah, people are missing a lot, I think, and don't realize what really is up there. And um, it would be nice that they knew. Yeah, it would. Uh, but we'd have to, you know, shut down the, the grid. Well, maybe <laughs> every so often that's not a bad idea. Yeah. It happened in Texas a couple of years ago, right, when the winter? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, not during the winter. It would have yeah. to be in a nice, you know, comfortable time, you know, especially with daylight savings time or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Barbara, back to you. But I'm thinking, yeah, the humans aren't <laughs> going to do that. Um, you know, I... I I go through these cycles where names start keep popping up. I, like Marla will remember a couple about last year, Boudica kept. Oh yeah, the up, uh, like every a Roman uh, English uh, woman yeah. uh, warrior leader. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, in your book, it, it hit me because I'm now in a Francis Bacon cycle. Oh yeah, yeah, he was something. He was, and you know, I'm starting to look at your what you were writing, thinking he did probably far more to restrict astrology or at least categorize it and shove it into a corner um, through his materialistic materialism, I should say. Well, I, I do mention him and I have a couple of quotes from him. I, I translated, you know, using Google to translate some of his stuff and, you know, from the Latin, he had quite a few pages on how astrology should be reformed and mm -hmm. developed scientifically. He wasn't against astrology at all. He just thought that a lot of astrologers took it too far and they didn't know what they were doing. And he thought that there were certain elements of it that should be discarded, but the rest of it should be tested and, and uh, developed. Mm -hmm. But he never did it. You know, Bacon was a theorist. He never did anything. But, but he basically came up with um, a, a, a cornerstone of modern science, and that's the idea of um, experimentation, you know, where you take – a, uh, a subject out of nature and you put it in a, uh, a laboratory mm -hmm. and then you dissect it and you learn how it works. And then you, you know, you can understand something from its parts. So it's, um, it's reductionist. It is. Um, he, he also just sort of thought that nature was um, a tool for humans to use. Yeah, well, so did uh, so did all the religious people, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, but it, it's sort of the situation where how do you take a person away from all the influences that could be there? I mean, we forget that we're not just our chart, but we're the chart of our parents. Yeah, well, you can't. Uh, I, that's yeah. that's human humans as well as non-human other non-human animals and uh, any other you know. Anything that's a system, you you can't really break it down into its parts and get anywhere with it. Mm -hmm. You ha you have to treat it as as a as a system, which means a holistic view. Um, you can apply reductionism, you know, scientific techniques to parts to learn a little bit here and there, but you're never going to understand the whole thing from one part. A system is is the, more than the sum of the parts. So Bacon was Bacon was brilliant. I mean, he, yeah. He, oh, yeah. he foresaw like psychology and sociology and political science. Uh, he, he was a theorist, but he was also a reductionist. And he gave the world a methodology of uh, that, you know, when it was combined with G Galileo's work uh, produced and then, you know, kind of brought to fruition with Newton, you know, produced what most people call science today. And I call it in the book reductionist, materialist, mecha uh, mechanistic science. Okay. Mm. Um, are there people, astrologers, that only deal with horoscopes and stuff and not have, maybe you said this earlier, not having any background deeper than that? And, yeah. And, and then are they really astrologers or are they 
<laughs> divination people. Um, I was trying to say it. Well, you're talking about the practice of astrology. Well, yeah, but I mean, you can learn how to read cards, you know, in in any way. You can learn how to make charts, but unless you know the background, unless you know more in doing study, is that really what they're doing? I mean, well, I mean, I think there are a lot of people that, you know, they learn the symbol system, you know, whether it's the planets in a birth chart or it's tarot, you know, mm-hmm. 22 tarot cards or a bunch of runes or right. any kind of symbol system. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're able to work with their intuition in ways that produces results. Yeah. And I understand that. I, I, I went through uh, many years, you know, experimenting with tarot and uh, other divination systems. Uh, mm-hmm. I actually, I have a, a good a chapter in the World Atlas of Divination, which is a great book, kind mm. of sums up divination systems. But I see right. divination as a, um, a use of the subconscious and, you know, you know, bypassing the rational part of the brain. I used to be quite good at doing that sort of stuff. And um, I would go, uh, I I was a musician for a long time, play the weekends and bands. I'm still doing it. But uh, mm. I would uh, I would bring things like astrodice. You ever see those? Mm-hmm. Astrodice were fun. I would have people roll them and not, you know, make a, you know, ask a question in their mind, but don't tell me. And then they would roll them and I would tell it. I would start bringing that up. But I, um, I was telling somebody this the other day, I, I had made a deck of business cards, you know, and I just looked at I used business cards like the way somebody would use tarot. And I would have them throw out a, you know, shuffle the deck and then I would put out a spread and read it. It was quite effective. And it just goes to show that if you are a good interpreter of symbols and you know how to, you know, seize that, you know, cubic centimeter of chance and, you know, know right when to move and shuffle the cards and do that, you can get pretty interesting results. Now, I think that this is what a lot of people call divination. And I think that we could learn more about about it if we studied uh, things like ESP, like they were doing in Princeton for a long time, and mm-hmm. learn more about the uh, workings of the mind and learn more about the workings of the self-organizing system that's a collective of minds. Uh, one example would be the stock market. Another mm-hmm. example would be, you know, the nation. Or another example would be, you know, like a, a family group. So in other words, when you have more than one person, they that the com- the communications between them actually form a, a, a kind of immaterial self-organizing system. And people study are developing theories about these things and showing how these self-organizing systems are really quite powerful and um, persistent. It sounds so complex, but maybe it really isn't. You know, some people look at things and say, oh, my God, I can't ever understand that because it's just it, it's just too much for me you know like you know whatever but um if people would open their minds and and want to look into things a little bit deeper i think i think that's really important to do yeah know? well learning is a lot of work there's no question about it and oh, yeah. I'm, i've been kind of a learning junkie my whole life i read a lot and uh think a lot um you know for the last you know 50 years, I've been trying to answer the question, what is astrology? <laughs> uh, n- now I'm h- more focused on what is reality. So, <laughs> oh, oh, that's a difficult yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, that is tough because that brings you into things like theory of mind and consciousness. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so uh, it's endless. If, if you're a, <laughs> if you like to learn, it's you know, you never run out of stuff to do. But I but most people have other things to do and they, uh, you know, they would like things to be more simplified. I think astrology can be broken down to a few things. I tell people that if you want to learn a little bit about astrology, you know, learn the signs and learn what the planets mean and pay attention to what goes on around you. You don't have to be a person that reads birth charts. I mean, you should be able to know your own birth chart and that of your friends and you know partners and whatnot. But just look at what goes on. Uh, follow follow what Mercury does when it goes when it stations and goes retrograde. And recently, Mars, you know, has been um, moving retrograde and then it stationed last week, and now it's going forward. And the part the places in the zodiac where these stations occur, they are hot. So if you happen to be a person who has eight degrees of Gemini on your chart. 
or or eight you know around eight degrees of Gemini, um, and it's uh, it, you know planet is located there, like Joe Biden, for example, and Mars stationed at eight degrees of Gemini last week. You know, all hell can break loose. But if but if you don't have a pl- uh, a position there, it's probably not going to affect you very much. Mm-hmm. So you you I'm encouraging people to be uh, observers watchers learn some astrology and then just watch and see how it works Mm -hmm. well i have um barbara every so often she'll say you know you know mars did this and pluto did that and and you got to watch out because everything's going to go wooky this week you know so so i have you know i don't have to study that part of it because she just you know hello this is what i have yeah and i have my friends who you know i can say whoa, I have Pluto in the first house in the solar return. And you know, they just sort of look at me, Barbara, and shake their head and say, Barbara, it has to be somewhere. You know, and yeah. you have to you have to learn to adapt to. Uh, and that's the other thing about astrology. It's learning how to adapt to these changes in these cycles, right? Yeah, it is. I think the best thing that astrology has to offer is self-knowledge. You learn about yourself. You learn about who you are. But then as you look at the planets, as they move on and change and they change their relationship to your birth chart planets, you learn how to adapt, as you said, or how to change. If your solar return has Pluto in the first house, that's a signal that, you know, you're ready to make an identity change of some sort. And maybe if you did nothing, an identity change would happen to you by default. Or maybe if you did something, acted on it and participated in it. Uh, you'd be able to have, uh, you know, something occur that's a little more that you'd be a little more comfortable with. Who knows? You know, <laughs> Was it, it you wrote, you put a quote in there, something to the effect of um, if you don't learn it, Saturn will drag you through it anyway. <laughs> well, that's the, that's what the Stoics said. The Stoics yep. talked a lot about um, fatality, free will. And and uh, they had a their their position is, is called causal determinism. But also compatibilism, because they they thought almost everything that we experienced was a result of some past cause. Mm -hmm. But there was a little wiggle room for people to make changes and to be more aware of things and to adjust. And that's where that came from. The one of the Stoics said that, yeah, you know, fate's like a dog walking behind a cart. You know, it can either do it and, and go along with the program or it could be dragged along. That was a little extreme, but that's their idea. And and they the Stoics taught that you should follow your own nature, not try to be somebody that you aren't. Try to be yourself and get better at it. Well, that you know that's something too. When people read about what they should be or what their sign uh, technically has certain traits, um, they just sometimes don't do anything but say well this is it this is me i can't be any other way and you know some of it might not be positive you know bad habits or something but no but but i'm a cancer so you know i walk sideways i don't go right in front of people um people have to kind of take that as kind of just a basic thing right and and yeah they've got to they've got to see the potential in themselves Mm -hmm. you know every every sign is not limited i mean if you're a cancer as i am you know it does Okay, so you know you're oh, we Barbara too. <laughs> Sorry, all three of us. There we <laughs> go. Well, three cancers. Well, wow. you know, a cluster of crabs. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's cancer can be you know overly emotional and defensive and so on, or you can work with it. You know, you can develop it. You can be you know, uh, you can use your protective urges rather than protecting just yourself you can nurture somebody else or some other thing or you can develop a collection or you can protect the uh save the whales you know there are many ways you can express cancer qualities that aren't negative and if you just get stuck with somebody's interpretation of the sign that's that's a shame yeah yeah Yeah. well you also get the people who um the uh the cynics and i've come across several of them you know if you refer to a sun sign you're a bigot um and also (laughs) you're taking away you're taking away somebody's free will by explaining their their chart to them and that's uh, again the the new science uh, uh the new astrologer denials 
Well, first of all, there are some people that should not have anything to do with astrology. <laughs> I learned that in my many years of practice. You just can't tell them anything. They're they're uh, they're traumatized for some reason. So you know, if it, it is true, some people who just would not do well hearing about themselves because they're very defensive and very sensitive, and they probably had a terrible childhood experience or experiences. But for the people that are open to it, it's a, a way of self knowledge and a way of personal growth, and it's a wonderful thing. But I don't think it's for everybody. Mm. All right, we are getting really close to running out of time. Um, Barbara and I both had kind of the same question to lead out with um, about the evolution of astrology from Mesopotamia to current times. You know, it's been a long journey. Yeah. Um, very quickly, is astrology still and will it continue to evolve? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> it, it, ha it has grown quite a bit. Uh, you have to remember that astrology was essentially banned and put in the closet for about 300 years. Yeah. And it kind of came out at the end of the 19th century with theosophy. And uh, there was kind of a wave of occult studies back then. And in the 20th century, it was um, made a little modern. Uh, the contribution of Dane Rudyard should not be ignored. I mean, he was just a right. a great one of the one of the great intellectuals of the time, mm -hmm. and and Carl Jung also. They uh, were interested in astrology. So there's been some growth. Uh, I think astrology has gotten a little a lot closer to psychology in the 20th century mm -hmm. than it was previously. It was very event oriented, and now it's more psychologically oriented. So that's a kind of growth. But I Good. think there's plenty of room uh, to, uh, for growth in astrology. Yeah. I think it has a great future myself. All right. Um, give everybody your website um, address and, and where they can find you and learn more about you and all that good stuff. Yeah, I, I don't really have a, a, you know, a, a website dedicated to me, but I have one called One Read, O-N-E-R-E-E-D dot com, which um, – is about Mesoamerican astrology. There are a few other things there. I put up some announcements. And then from there, you can get to naturalastrology.com, where I have some articles that are about natural astrology. So there is something up there. Perfect. Well, I wish we had two hours, but we don't. So thank you so much for joining us. And, and at least the tip of the iceberg got done tonight. <laughs> well, you're welcome. My pleasure. Nice to speak. I only have you. about 6,000 more questions. So. <laughs> yeah, we, we might have to do it again. Okay. <laughs> All right. And Barbara, thank you for being here with us, too. Thank you. Well, awesome. I love the book, people. You really should read it. If you want to learn anything about astrology or starting to learn astrology, this book is great. Yes, it is. All right. Well, until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more fun. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without permission is strictly prohibited. You have been listening to the Para-X Radio Network. 